It's in studio with the co-hosts today, Hall of Famer Matt Miller. Good day. No orange jacket, but an orange polo. I, I wore it just for you because you. you always bring it up, but I I, I'm not wearing the jacket, so I, I did have the orange. We here. broadcast our uh, football games from the Matt Miller press box. <laughs> now it's it's the, the booth. Matt there, booth. There's some kind of a booth within the. It's you got the, a booth. Yeah, I got a booth. That's cool. Yeah. So also I, on uh, duty today, John the Bod, John Bodwell, tallest co-host we've ever had. Oh well, and I I wear that proudly. Thank you, Rob. I. I Bring up the average height in the room, especially when it's, you know, I work with you in height, which height's not here today. We have He the, is the average height, isn't he? He is the he average height. Height is the average height. <laughs> Way below average height. Way <laughs> sorry. Mr. <laughs> Lacko height. <laughs> That'd be the voice of the mogul, Delegate Mike Hornby, mogul. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you today? Great. We are ready to grill you on this bill that you wrote for the uh, premium had, insurance yeah, increases. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I wrote it. Studied it. No, I got a presentation on it. Voted on it. That page, uh, page eight, line seventeen is <laughs> really page. the one that, yeah, that gets page. me. Well, he doesn't need to tell you what it says. Yeah. You know, you wrote it. <laughs> Spring is here. <laughs> hey, at nine thirty-five. By the way, I want to uh, tell you our guest is. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how he pronounced it. If you served with him, is it is it by Elias Coop Gonzalez or Elias? No, Elias. Uh, I just call him Coop. 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 Coop's got an interesting story. He's yes. a young man, a delegate out of the 67th. He's only 20 years old. First generation immigrant. Great, great. Uh, real nice guy. Really, uh, really, really conservative. Yeah. And and really. you said there were three of you in the legislature who were yeah, from other, uh, other countries? Yeah. Uh, a German, a, I think Coop's from uh, Guatemala, and I'm from Zimbabwe. So, yeah. Zimbabwe. Did three you? of us that were first generation immigrants. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool. Right? Yeah. He's got a great story, though. Yeah. Well, yeah. we'll save it for when he gets yep. here, but I just want to let everybody know along the way that's a pretty neat little tale that we will be telling. Uh, with uh, you, sir, I would like to talk to you a little bit about, um, first and foremost, the SSAC. Okay. You're heading back for interim sessions on, uh, what, Sunday? Yes. Sunday we go back. Uh, One o'clock we start. Any chance with enough of you in a room, you'll get together and overturn the governor's veto of the... Uh, bill which would have made the SSAC more accountable to the legislature. I don't think that's a, a, a cross we're going to die on this, uh, this this session or during the interims. Uh, it is what it is. The the governor, you know, did veto it. He, he has uh, his opinion. He's a coach. Um, but I can tell you it's not something that we're going to give up on. Uh, I think we're going to attack it full force next session. Um, and I think the, the writing's on the wall um, that it's coming. Weld was a proponent of that out of the Senate, if yes, I recall, right? very much so. Yeah. Right. So the, the governor vetoes it. It would only take a simple majority to override the veto. Any idea why there's no temperature in the room for overriding it? Well, I've only spoken to local leadership, but, um, you know, the, it's a big deal to, try, to, to override. And, and it, it's just, hey, let's move on. We can get that next session. We've still got time. Um, so... Um, I got told, hey, you know what, let's just, we'll just do, it was the same thing with the DHHR bill last year that was vetoed. It's the same bill that we passed this year. Um, so if we didn't go up back and veto the DHHR one, I don't think we're going to worry about uh, the SSAC rules um, bill. We had Julie Abel on yesterday, and Julie, going back probably five, six years now, has been kind of our teacher correspondent to the program in regards to uh, how she feels about bills and tells us how people she works with feel about the uh, schools and conditions and and such and one of the things that she talked about yesterday was the upcoming premium increases for PEIA you folks provided a $2300 pay raise to try to offset premium increases uh, are you concerned at all about the mood of the teaching community regarding how this whole thing washes no I, and I think uh, the the, uh, the PEIA uh, People are moving around the state, informing teachers, showing them what the exact uh, increases they are. I provided you with the PowerPoint that was provided to the uh, mm -hmm. legislature, and that's kind of what I based my vote on. It, you know, to me, uh, and I know Julie said some things yesterday, and I, I truly respect her, but I don't think she has her numbers right, and I don't think she's truly informed. Uh, when you look at that. Uh, that PowerPoint, I, I did refer you to Jeremiah Samples, who uh, put this whole thing together. He worked for the D, uh, for, in, in PEIA. Um, I think it's a pretty good deal. And when you look at the 
premium increases for the private citizen or the um, the rest of the state over the last since the Affordable Care Act um, came came in. Everybody's uh, premiums have gone up uh, substantially. This is a small um, increase, and I, I think every level of teacher is co every level of public employee is covered by that raise. The more you make, the less you know you're, you're covered. But it, it, essentially, everybody is covered um, by their raise. I don't think the top brackets are necessarily. Are I think they? the top brackets are very very close. Um, they're close. They're, they're, they're very. They're, yeah. Everybody's covered. I, you know. The, we we went through each level. Um, yes, the very very top are, are, but they can afford that that premium increase. Well, I mean, in order for PEIA to go from paying sixty percent of what Medicare pays to hospitals and providers to go to one hundred and ten percent, where people are actually going to accept it, people can doctors and hospitals can can pay their bills from it. I mean, th there we, had to be some sort of an increase. I mean, yeah. I. I was paying uh, close to $2,000 uh, just last year for my health insurance for me and two two children in college. I mean, you mean 2000 a month? 2000 a month, excuse yeah, me. I, I was paying 24000 a year. Yeah, if you ask a public employee what their actual premium is because of the 80-20, um, the public will be pretty impressed with how low those premiums still are. By they're, the way... Impressed or not impressed? I think the public would be. Oh, they're still low. They're very, very low. Um, and and yeah. when you look at the actual premium they're paying, uh, we were up there. Uh, we weren't the eighty twenty. We, we the state was paying a lot more than eighty. So this this really addresses the issue. Doesn't fix it completely, but it gets us going in the right direction. And I think the oversight by the board and holding them accountable is what's really impressive well, on this bill. And people in the private sector will still be very, very, very envious of how low the premiums are for the people on PEIA. And the people on PEIA should know that. They should and, understand that they are getting a great deal on their health coverage. And, and they were get, they were paying a lot less, but we were in dire straits where people were starting to not take PEIA. Right. And we had a choice. You can either pay for insurance that people won't take, mm -hmm. or we could fix the problem and we can actually... Uh, <laughs> pay you know, get what you pay for and it's a good plan i think yeah that's where my mind keeps going if if you don't fix it what good is having the insurance even it, though it's cheap if you can't really it goes use away it, right right it, it, it was one of those things where we had to address it or it was a dead program but you said this is not a permanent fix so no th I, I think this is the the first step um, and, and again, I wasn't part of the, the planning of this. I'm not mm -hmm. on any of those committees. But when you looked at it as a whole, as a legislator, what you were voting on, this was the best bet that we could give them. Um, and I thought as a, first, uh, as a first step, I think this is moving in the right direction. What is, uh, what overall, what was the percentage that it's going to go up just for the average state employee? I can't remember the exact, as I said, I don't um, I don't. I think it was uh, was eighteen percent or something like that, Rob. Um, it, it's all in there um, in that that thing. But the, it was an increase. But in the end, um, it's what's best for the, the the state employees as well as the state. Yeah, if you have insurance that nobody takes, or having one in seven and a half, as we we talked about earlier, one in seven and a half West Virginians are covered under PEIA. If the the pay rate of what of what it pays facilities doctors, I mean, one in seven and a half people, if paying that low of sixty percent of what Medicare does, is just driving hospital. It's going to drive more hospitals out of business, more drive more doctors out of West Virginia, and we already have a lot of areas of our state that have a dearth of of physicians. Yeah, I agree. So I, I was looking at uh, some of the stats in this mound of paperwork that was put out. I think you saw as a slideshow. Yeah, we saw it as a PowerPoint. Right, PowerPoint. By the way, Delegate uh, Paul Espinosa texted me and said, once the legislature goes signy die, you can no longer override a veto. There you that go. We've had to have done before. See, that's why. That's time. why it's great to have Paul and Eric and, and John down there because they know a lot more than, than than we do. It's also why it's great to have them listening to the show. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> uh, Paul, I, I actually should get Paul to co-host because <laughs> when we're discussing something, he knows the answer. He immediately texts it to me, which is and, and cool. it's funny because yeah, I've been listening to Paul uh, on this show for years, um, and. I always kind of write him off, and you know, he, he's very smart, and he, he's much smarter than me. Uh, but 
since I've been elected, when he speaks, um, I tend to listen a lot more because <laughs> there's a wealth of, of knowledge that you can get from that man. He, he really mm -hmm. does know his stuff. So I want to I want to run through a scenario here that was put out during this uh, presentation that you saw, Mike. And it okay. assumes you have two school teachers in Berkeley County, or any any county for that okay. matter. A two teacher household, one teacher making sixty thousand, the other making forty thousand. So combined, they have a one hundred thousand dollar household income. Uh, for two state employees, the average of the two employees' salaries determines the salary level. Family of four. Two adults, two kids, plan selection, PEIA, PPB, plan A, family with employee spouse. Now, assuming the pay raise of $2,300 per employee, that would be a $4,600 raise, okay, plus the tax cut. Your premium before the changes was $228 a month for that family of four medical insurance. That's pretty impressive. Very. And I know, John, you're already wincing in pain. I'm at I'm at two grand. I mean, two, two grand, grand a month. I'm I'm in the private sector. Okay, that's what it was before the legislature uh, did their work to try to basically save PEI from going bankrupt in four or five years. You have your pay raise of four thousand six hundred dollars. Your premium, new premium now, will be three thirty six sixty nine monthly. So it was two twenty eight. It's going to be three thirty six. That's a one hundred and eight dollar and sixty nine cent a month premium increase for those two teachers making sixty and so forty or so twelve twelve hundred people will accept so twelve hundred and ninety six dollars more total a year and what was then forty six hundred was the raise you get a four thousand six hundred dollar raise between the two this is before taxes i mean I, i'm raises, not raises are before taxes premium no. increases are after taxes. right well I'm, i mean i'm not an accountant i mean i know we have you know some accountants who come on ken apple who's great um, but I mean, I can do the math, and that seems like a pretty good, you know, well, hold positive. On. There's more. The estimated total household personal income tax cut savings they would get would be six hundred and fifty dollars and eighty four cents. Car tax rebate, assuming two average priced used cars, and they base it out of Canal County, would be two forty three eighty four. So take that two forty three eighty four car rebate, six fifty eighty four PIT break, plus the forty six hundred dollar raise. Subtract out the one thousand three hundred and four dollar and twenty eight cent premium increase over the course of a year, and that two teacher household is four thousand one hundred ninety dollars forty cents ahead of where they and, uh, and that's probably one out. of the examples that are very positive. So if you have two state employees yeah. averaging fifty thousand, mm -hmm. so you know for somebody, and that's the, the 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 folks I've talked to in the public, the, the that's a lot of the scenarios that we're seeing. It's the folks that have a uh, spouse that their business or their employer offers um, um, insurance. Those are the ones that are, are, are not quite sure of where they stand because of the spousal, um, what do they call it? The, the, they call it a tax, but it's 100 and something dollars. One, 100, 147, 147, I think. I'm you know, 147 still. Really well, good. if somebody, I mean, if, if you have one spouse who's a teacher, the other spouse who, who works for a company, they are in the public sector, just like I am, paying $2,000 a month. We should not be subsidizing the health insurance for the person who works in the public sector and has a public sector job. And by that, we're also then subsidizing their employer, who's not and, having to pay the employer's part. And, and the whole point of this is to get more people on private insurance, right? So that our private insurance can come down. That that when, when you have a spouse that say works for a bank and is offered um, insurance, they should take that insurance from their private. And that that's the goal. That was the whole goal of the Affordable Care Act, right? Well, is it in the bill, the PEIA bill, or are they? If if someone is offered private insurance through their their employer, they must take they it. must take it. They must okay. take, or they get the one forty one seven whatever that that number is. I believe that was in there too. Yeah, hundred. But that's still that that penalty pales probably it, it, pales in comparison right. to what they're paying for the public insurance. Yes, there needs to be a little more disparity on that. Yeah. So they, there are there are several different scenarios that they cover in here based on they, they really where, where do kind of cover yeah. and they don't but, go but with, they all take into account the tax cuts and, and, that, a, and go you got to realize the the, the PAI bill that the, the raise the tax cuts they were all built together right so in tandem with each other mm -hmm. so 
um, when you look at it as a whole, that and when we voted, we voted in order. We voted for the um, the race, and then we voted for the PEIA. It was all voted to together, was presented together, and that that's mm -hmm. you got to look at it like that as a, as a whole. A couple of things here: SB two sixty eight's impact on retirees. Medicare retirees are not directly impacted by Senate Bill two sixty eight. No. That's what we're discussing here today. Non Medicare retirees are projected to see a seven percent increase in the cost of their care, but any impact to premium is contingent upon a decision by the PEIA Finance Board. What does that mean? Any idea? Uh, again, a, a little above my uh, pay grade. If the PEIA Finance Board applies a premium increase to the non-Medicare retiree plan, it would be up to that 7%. So you could see a 7% increase in your uh, PEI premiums if you were a non-Medicare retiree. 7 is pretty but so, but seven percent. I mean, say uh, a retiree who's not yet of Medicare age is paying, you know, say they're paying three hundred dollars a month on PEIA. Seven percent is only twenty one dollars a month. I mean, we're not we're not looking at and that's when, a non retiree. When, when you talk about percentages, uh, a percentage of a small number is a small number. Yeah. So uh, I told you the scenario where if you had two teachers in West Virginia married teachers, what the scenario was with the tax cuts included, they would be ahead by $4,199.40 uh, before taxes. If you have a single CPS worker uh, starting their career out at a starting salary of thirty, basically $36,000, uh, that person would be ahead $2,379.05 after the premium increase, again, before taxes. You have a DHHR economic service worker with family, spouse, but with no employer insurance, they would be ahead three thousand two forty seventy five, and a married teacher with spouse that is employer insurance offered, they would be ahead one thousand six fifty ninety two. And again, this takes into account the premium increase from PEIA, the personal income tax cut that should have already kicked in in your paycheck, and if it hasn't, I'm talk to your it. talk yep. to your uh, personnel office. Uh, and uh, also takes into account the car rebate. Yep. Right. Is there? Is and there? Those are all average numbers. Is there any sector? Are there any public employees that see a negative from all of these so, things financially? So I think the the higher your salary is, the closer it gets to uh, being an even wash. And I, I think there were some cases where, because we do have public employees that do make a substantial amount of money. Um, those people eat. You know, they will. They were washing out. They're in the hole. According to, according to they're, this, they're in the hole. They're they're paying a little more, but as when you look at the percent I, of their salary, it's so much less. I'll give well, you I think I think on, Bobby Jeff. Huggins being uh, being one of the public employees. I he, think he's he, not on PEI. I think he can he's handle the. Uh, yeah, if you no. make if you make according to this. Family PPB Plan A premiums with a $2,300 pay raise, assuming this employee goes up a salary bracket, and as we know, mm -hmm. things are based on the salary bracket for your PEI premiums. If this knocks you up a bracket and you make 83101 to 108100 you would be down 29502 at the end of the year. Okay. $295 out of 108 Yeah. Now, if you make 108101 to 133100 you are in the hole $1,028.33. And if you make 133101 or more, you're in the hole $1,123.32 at the end of the year. So basically, you're going to see a $100 a month health insurance premium increase if your salary is 133 or more. If it's less than that, your increase will be less than $100 a month. And if you make less than 83101 then you will not end up paying more for your health insurance than the raise covered. Well, I think if you're if you're making 130,000 plus in West Virginia, what you're 97th, 98, 98% of West Virginians, you're doing pretty well already. You're, yeah, you're you're We shouldn't be if you're making that salary. much money, we don't need to subsidize your health insurance as much as no, we do it, it, we for do. somebody who's sacrificing. It, I I'm, I think we should. I mean, I think that's the the benefit of going into uh, the public uh, works is that they do get a subsidized uh, benefits and, and you know, things like that. But I think if you're making that much money, you should pay a little. Now, more. without a doubt, yeah, if you're in the public, if you're in the the, if you're working for the government, you deserve subsidized health yeah. insurance. I mean that that's just part of the deal. I agree with that. Yeah. You deserve subsidized health insurance. Well, you I don't deserve, know if you deserve it. 
But you, I mean, it's, you get it's it. part of it's, that, it's that, part that's of the, the, that's the deal but, that we have. Those are the cards it, we're playing. But it's part yeah. of the trade off for taking a lesser salary. You get more benefits, so everything evens out. You get pensions, yeah. other things. Now uh, that that scenario I showed you is the only scenario whereby somebody is directly underwater, based on premium increases. The rest of the scenarios, if if you do the family plan where you don't jump a bracket. Nobody is below water. And, and these are all the Cadillac plans, too, that, you, that you're looking yeah. at, too. And, this and is the Cadillac plan. These are the plan two. A. There, there are other plan B and yes. things that you can get much less now, if you like. Now, if you're a single employee and you're the only person on your, your health insurance and you do the plan A, uh, nobody there uh, clears less than $1,200 before taxes from yeah. the premium increasing. Yes. So, so yeah. nobody's underwater in that scenario. In a single scenario. In a single scenario. And in the single scenario where your salary bracket is frozen, it works out even better. Nobody is, uh, is worse off. Uh, in fact, the, the least improvement you'll get is 1562.89 at the top salary bracket. And if you're making 50000 or less, you're still $2,000 up at the end of the year. Again, that's before taxes. Taxes is going to take a chunk of that, too. And you know that hospitals and doctors are actually going to take your plan. They're not going to put you at the back of the line. Well, you know, the premiums had to go up at some point, and I, I know there are reasons throughout history in the state as to why uh, the idea of keeping those premiums as low as possible made sense because we weren't giving raises out for many years. Mm -hmm. Those premiums, if you go back, I think it's 10, 12 years, I think increased about a dollar a month. Yeah, and total, we, total, not a dollar yeah. every, and the every state, year. The every state month. kept putting more and more money in every single yeah. year, and that number was compounding on itself. So I think it was, what, $80 million this year is what, what, what it equated to. But yeah, it's in here The somewhere. next time was, you know, 190 and then in four years it was like $400 million, and it kept just getting bigger mm -hmm. and bigger and bigger because the, the cost of the, the – the, um, the health insurance, insurance yeah. is, is just going up. It's so you, you just can't, you can't. Um, so I think, you know, in the end, it's a great deal for everybody. It's a great deal for a rate for West Virginia uh, as a government. It's a good deal for the, the private sector. It's a good deal for public uh, employees. Well, it's a great deal for everybody because it, it's going to keep our health system going. It's going to keep doctors and, here, hospitals open. And if we, you know, if if a giant hospital system like WVU stopped taking PEI at some point, it would be devastating to the state. And you're just forcing everybody out of state then. Do you anticipate the, uh, so long as the surplus is provided, do you anticipate the legislature continuing to vote raises in for state employees, Mike? I do. I mean, I, I still think we've got a long way to go. Um, we, we, we've definitely got a correctional um, officer issue. We've got a CPS issue. We've got um, uh, you know, a, a recruitment issue within our uh, teachers. We got to get more teachers going to school. Um, if you look at the numbers that are being graduated out of WVU, they're just tens, twenty percent less every single year. I think the number was like four hundred and seventy teachers graduated WVU. Um, That's small. That is a huge university com coming down from ten years ago. You're at like eighteen hundred. We have an issue, and, and it's not just West Virginia. I think this is a – people are looking at it and going, well, do I really want to be a teacher based on what we have in the classrooms and the society? And the, the, it, we have a bigger issue than just paying teachers. Mm -hmm. has, has there been talk about with a lot of this um, opioid settlement money we're going to get – about propping up CPS and other social service things with that directly with that money because I mean I know a lot of the problems we have with the foster system and everything are are caused by the opioid epidemic so I, I think and correct me if I'm wrong but I think that's up to the counties and the municipalities I think it's the, the, the way that money is being distributed is, is going back to the counties and the municipalities I know you know Berkeley County Martinsburg they're fighting over how much and who, who they're who's getting what but um, I don't have, I don't know any specific plans, or I haven't been involved in any talks about specific plans with any of that uh, opioid money. I know it's going to be in a foundation, and it's coming. But until they actually get it and they start spending it, I don't know what the, the actual plan is.